White Knight is a game of light and shadow. It begins with a nighttime drive through the countryside while jazz plays on the radio. And this drive is cut short by an accident, one which leaves you, the player, injured and seeking help at the nearest place that you can find. Which just so happens to be a large creepy mansion that you've crashed in front of. This mansion becomes the setting for this survival horror game. The first thing that attracted me to White Knight was the art style. It's got a very distinctive, super high contrast black and white style. Everything is always either pure black or pure white, which not only makes for an interesting art style, but it also serves to emphasize that light is your friend and darkness is your enemy. Darkness not only hides the enemies, but it also hides resources that you need to survive. If something is hidden in the dark, not only are you probably not going to see it, but even if you happen to know it's there, your character won't be able to interact with it unless it's illuminated. Your main weapons against darkness are either lights or matches. Lights can be found within the mansion itself, and are often as easy as just flipping a switch. But sometimes it's more hard and you have to find a disconnected cord that you have to plug back in, or maybe you have to actually solve a puzzle to get the power turned back on. And matches are your own personal light source. They are your flashlight, your lantern. They are your limited resource that you constantly want to hoard and use as little of as possible and find as much of in the environment as you can. There's a limited number of matches in the mansion and they do burn out very fast, so you really want to be careful with how you use them and you want to find as many as you can. I really like the use of matches as your main light source compared to a lot of other survival horror games because what often happens is they use something like a flashlight or a lantern and to make the feeling of, to make the, f the pressure of, of darkness more pronounced, and to put more limitations on your resources, what they often do is they make it so that the fuel for your light source, be it a battery or literally a fuel for a lantern, they often make it so that those resources run out extremely quickly, to a completely ridiculous degree. To the point where your batteries might last like one minute, which is completely absurd. Even in the, the least efficient, you know, incandescent flashlight, your batteries are going to last a hell of a lot longer than that. So it often ends up feeling very contrived and just ridiculous. But because they, use, because they use matches, it actually works out really well, because matches are naturally just a very quick burning thing. They just don't last very long. They burn out probably within a minute. Sometimes they don't even light properly. The light is always wavering and getting dangerously close to burning your own fingers, and it becomes a question of how long are you willing to hold on to it before it starts burning you. So I think the use of matches as your main light source is really clever. It's just a naturally very fragile source of light. It doesn't give off much light, often doesn't light, it's very quick, it just feels uncomfortable to use them as a light source. Which is absolutely perfect for a survival horror game because you're not supposed to feel comfortable. You're supposed to feel like you're always on edge, like you always need more stuff and you're always running out of things. White Knight also has fixed camera angles, which are a bit of a staple for survival horror games. This gives the whole game a sort of uncomfortable but also kind of cinematic feeling. Because the camera angles are often cockeyed and in uncomfortable places where you're, they're not exactly ideal for seeing the environment, for seeing everything that you want to see, which makes them often uncomfortable. There were many times where I found myself coming into a room and thinking, is there something in the room with me off the camera, off the edge of the camera where I can't see? It's really nerve-wracking. The camera angles aren't without their flaws, though. The good thing about them is that they made it so that I couldn't see everything in the room which made me uncomfortable, but the bad thing about them is that they made it so I couldn't see everything in the room, so I felt kind of uncomfortable. Now, I should clarify, this game is much more focused on the adventure side of things than the survival horror side. It doesn't really have anything that I would consider combat, and I would say that for roughly the first 75% of the game, there's very few things that can actually kill your character. So for a huge chunk of the game, the camera angles are really not a problem. You know, they are uncomfortable, and when you walk into a room and the, the fixed camera angle suddenly changes to something completely different, it is kind of disorientating. But if you're not running away from enemies or in peril for some reason, then it's really not that big of a deal. It's, it's not very frustrating, it's just a little bit of an inconvenience. However, the problem arises when the game does the typical gamey thing of making it so that 
more and more dangers pop up the further into the game you get. And when I found myself running away from enemies all the time, I found that this started to really poke holes in the design of the game for me. It really started to show the problems that come out of fixed camera angles. It often led to me dying for reasons that felt very cheap. It often felt like I wasn't dying because I just did something stupid or forgot a game mechanic or something like that, or my reaction time wasn't good, but rather, I often felt like I was dying because the game was just being unfair. Because the camera angles just suddenly change when you go through a door. So just imagine you're being chased by some angry spirit that's trying to suck your soul out of your face. And you go through, you know, you're running and you're scared, and you can barely see anything because you're holding a, a freaking match running away from a ghost. And you, you're just running and running and running and you go through a door, and suddenly the camera angle is com fa facing a completely different way. So then suddenly you have to com just like instantly reorient your, your spatial sense and flick the, the stick or WASD if you're using keyboard in the right direction to compensate. And of course, since you're running, the camera angles are changing super fast. Every time you enter a new doorway or something like that, it's going to change and often be something completely different. And it also doesn't help that the movement of the main character is kind of sluggish. It's a bit slow to react, especially if you're sprinting. And of course, you're going to be sprinting if you're running away from a ghost. So often, while trying to keep your light source going, running through the dark, with the camera angle constantly changing as you're being chased by a ghost, I would often find myself having to suddenly switch directions because I found out that the way that I was running before was going to run me right into another ghost. And often the character didn't respond very fast, or maybe the camera angle changed at just the wrong time, and I find myself just running smack dab right into a ghost, which then claws at my face and I die. To make things even worse, White Knight also has fixed save points, which is also a survival horror staple. This means that I often found myself dying and then suddenly going back and losing a bunch of progress, which often felt like just rubbing salt in the wound of annoyance. Now, of course, I get why survival horror games often have fixed save points, because if you can't save anywhere, it makes it a lot more tense when you die. When you're in danger, there's actually something at stake. Whereas if you can just, like, F5 to do a quick save right before running into a room where something bad might happen, it kind of takes away a lot of the, the sense of danger. So I get why there's fixed save points. I think that's okay. But if the reason I'm being sent back to those fixed save points feels cheap, then it's not so okay. So all these problems with the fixed camera angles, the character movement, and the fixed save points they really didn't show themselves early on in the game because I wasn't put under much danger. But as I continued on and things became more dangerous and more enemies appeared, they really started to become more pronounced. Most of what I found myself doing in the game was pretty standard survival horror adventure game kind of stuff. Mostly just unlocking more and more parts of this huge mansion. It kind of grows and almost becomes an entity in and of itself as you continue on in the game. And, of course, to open further parts of the mansion, it typically comes down to either finding a literal key that you, you know, put into the lock in the door, or maybe a more figurative key, such as uh, finding a source of light to drive away a spirit that's guarding the entrance to a door. Something like that. Pretty typical stuff. Nothing terribly interesting going on there. Uh, most of the puzzles are pretty straightforward. Uh, for the most part, there, there's nothing too complex. I never found myself really reaching for a walkthrough, except for one part... There was one part where I thought I had solved a puzzle, but I actually hadn't. You see, puzzles are typically kind of localized to one area in this game. So maybe there's one room or like a collection of rooms where you have to do stuff, and it's usually pretty obvious when you're done with that section and you usually never need to come back to it. You just kind of do the stuff there, solve the puzzles that are present, get the key or keys, and then move on to another part of the, of the mansion. And I felt like I solved that section of the mansion. My journal even said that I basically just need to go downstairs and go to a certain door and that's where I need to continue. But every time I try to go downstairs, some little bit of text would pop up saying something that basically said, I can't leave this floor because there's still something to do here. So I was so confused. I'm like, the journal seems to be telling me to go downstairs, but I can't. It seems to think there's something still here, but the journal seems to want me to go downstairs. So I was so confused to the point where I thought maybe the game had actually bugged out and something hadn't registered properly and it just wasn't letting me go downstairs when it should. And I ended up having to look up a video walkthrough on YouTube to find out that no, I had actually missed something. It turned out that my goal in that section of the mansion was not just to find out where to go, which is to the door downstairs, but actually also to get the key for the door downstairs. And that fact was never made clear to me, which was really frustrating because I felt like I was completely without direction. Right, I felt like the game was telling me to go downstairs because of what it said in the journal, but then when I got there it said, you can't go downstairs. It was extra frustrating because I didn't know what the game expected of me. 
It wasn't like I was sitting in front of a puzzle and I just didn't know how to solve it. It's that I didn't even know where the puzzle was. I didn't even know there was a puzzle. I thought I was done. I was just completely left without any direction. Any, you know, thing to shoot for. So that was a pretty frustrating situation. But for the most part, the puzzles in the game are pretty straightforward. Nothing you're going to get terribly stuck on. Not particularly boring or interesting, just kind of middle of the road. The story of White Knight is mainly told through notes that you find around the mansion. Now, I know a lot of people probably don't really like notes. I suspect a lot of people don't even read them. But I actually kind of do. So long as they're used responsibly. And this game does not use them responsibly. And by that I mean, there's so many notes! There's like, oh my god, there's so many notes. You can't go two feet without stumbling over a note. Just notes. You're clawing your way through notes and there's like a doorway and you have to like punch all the notes out of the doorway just to get through and use like a pickaxe to pickaxe the, the notes out of your... Oh, okay, it's not quite that bad, but seriously, there's a lot of notes. I would estimate that the average number of notes per room is probably about five. There really is just way too many notes. It's, it's just too dense. And I actually did read them all, by the way. Every single note that I came across, I read fully. By the end of the game, I think I'd probably found maybe 75% or, or more of the notes. The story that revealed itself to me through reading these notes was actually pretty interesting, to be honest. It involved the Great Depression, a family that is very sick and just completely dysfunctional. There are serial killings that have been happening in the area, which are of course connected to the family, although I won't spoil how. There's even some stuff in the story about strange rituals being performed to cleanse the house. Rituals involving the moon, and astronomy, and even alchemy. The story is nothing amazing, but there's actually some pretty interesting stuff in there. The only problem is just that it's delivered way too densely. It just throws the story at your face and hopes some of it sticks. And that sort of clumsiness that White Knight has is something that continues throughout the entire game. In fact, there's actually one event right at the very end of the game that I want to talk about because I think it's really hilarious and kind of illustrates it perfectly. And don't worry, I'm not going to spoil the end of the game. So there's a scene at the end of the game where, for reasons that I won't spoil, your character walks extremely slowly. And you're presented with two options on where you can go. You can either go to a light source to your left or a light source to your right. And these light sources are very far away, so you can't really see what's actually there. You just have to pick a direction and, and go with it. So for no particular reason, I chose to go to the left. And of course, because my character walks extremely slowly, it took a very, very long time to get there, to that spotlight. And I got there, and what was waiting for me was a note. I read the note, and it was interesting, but then I thought, okay, what now? Do I continue on? And then I realized, no, I can't continue on. I have to go back to the spotlight I came from. So... In silence, I just really awkwardly, very, very slowly, spend like an entire minute just going back to the original spotlight I came from, and then going to the other spotlight, to the right. A minute or more spent just really slowly retracing my steps, and then going the other way. And it's the other way, it's the way to the right, that actually leads to the ending of the game. The way to the left, which is the one I took, just leads to a note. I think this is a great illustration of how clumsy this game often is, because the fact that I chose to go to the left, which wasn't spurred by any particular reason, I didn't have any reason to choose one direction over the other, I just went left, the fact that I chose to go to the left ended up completely ruining the pace of the ending. You know, it's supposed to be this big dramatic scene, and I spent like a minute to a minute and a half just agonizingly slowly walking and retracing my steps back. It was so awkward, and it was right at the end of the game, it was just so strange. So that's a lot of criticisms, but I do think this game is actually pretty damn good. I quite enjoyed it. I think the only thing that it does that's really exceptional is the art. I think the art style is really great. It just looks great, it's really unique. I just loved it. And most of the other stuff that it does is just generally pretty good to kind of mediocre. So it's, it's kind of a mixed bag. There's a lot of frustrations and a lot of clumsiness, but the art looks great, it's got a really nice jazzy soundtrack, and... I think the thing I like about it the best, probably, just overall, is the atmosphere of it. Which mostly comes from the art style and from the music. I think if you look at each part individually, it seems like this game wouldn't really be that great. But there's something about the way everything comes together that actually ends up kind of working. If you'd like to get White Knight yourself, you can get it from a bunch of different places, and I'll have links to all of that in the description. Thank you for watching.